Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar-chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Hey, you're tuned into another edition of the business side of music. In the studio today, the title that I guess you continue to wear in this town that's been imposed on you, uh, the guitar guru of Music Row. Dave Isaacs is with us. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Songwriter, musician, teacher, and of course, the author of the book, uh, The Perpetual Beginner, A Musician's Path to Lifelong Learning. Let's start at the very beginning. Sure. As I was reading in your book, your I guess your original intent was not necessarily to play guitar or learn guitar. You come from a music family. I do. My mother played, still plays piano. My father played guitar. There was always a lot of music playing in the house. So it was something that I was raised to believe was important. I also think it's just something that I connected to right from the beginning. I always responded very strongly to music. And so I took up guitar. I'd taken piano lessons as a kid a couple of times, never really took to it until my mother found a teacher that was letting me play by ear instead of working out of that little red book that everybody had. He was teaching me folk tunes by ear on the piano. He would write down the notes, but just the melody. And so I'd memorized the melody, and he was teaching me chords. And that I took to. Then we, we moved, and I never found another teacher. And then I played the flute for about six months in fifth grade, which didn't really have any. I think I just took it up because two of my friends were, and they were in the band. So I went and I did that too. I don't think I was very good at it or particularly into it. And then we moved to New York, where apparently little boys didn't play the flute. And uh, yeah, that, that was gone very quickly. And so... The guitar came into your life, I guess, through uh, a unique circumstance. You're, we talked about this uh, before, but your mother wanted you to have purpose in life. As- well, that was part of it. It was more like, okay, summer's coming. I don't want you laying around the house all day watching The Price is Right. So what, what, what are you, you going to do, do this yeah. summer? Do you want to go to camp? No, I do not want to go to camp. You know, typical suburban uh, Long Island upbringing, I guess. She said, pick something that you can concentrate on. You need to do something this summer. And she maintains that I said, okay, I'm gonna start taking guitar lessons. That's the story she tells, so I'll go with that. I guess I had been really getting very into music in the couple of years before that. So I think I started being aware of popular music. And so my folks were into folk music and classical music, mostly was what I grew up hearing around the house. So I started being aware of pop music, I guess, seventh grade, something like that. And then all of a sudden, there's this whole world that became very exciting. And so when I took up the guitar, I was already, I knew that music spoke to me. I knew that I responded very strongly to it. I always have. It was a a shock to me to learn that not everybody has music playing in their heads all the time. This was a surprise. Yeah, that's exactly, I think, the perfect statement. Some people just have the gift. And we talked about this with guitar playing uh, before the show. You know, a lot of people get interested in playing guitar, want to learn the instrument, and then they only get so far, and then it winds up in the in the right. closet. And it's really and, what the book is about. Yeah, a lot of- gathers dust. But with you, it came a part of you, playing the guitar, learning the instrument. And you're right, you have to... You have to hear that music all the time, I think, really, to want to go on to the next step, the next level. I think so, but it's also, I mean, I did a lot of thinking about this in the course of writing the book. Where this whole thing started was, so I've been teaching guitar for 30 years. I started to notice, since I've come to Nashville, I've been working primarily with songwriters, artists, and 
a lot of adults who love music and had played for a while and put it down and want to get back to it. I know quite a few songwriters who have retired or semi-retired from a career of some kind come to Nashville to devote some energy, to devote real energy to songwriting. And so a lot of those people are coming back to the guitar. And so I find that I was hearing over and over again from people, I've played for 20 years, but I haven't gotten better in 15. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Or it didn't have to be that long, but there was a frequent expression of, I still feel like a beginner, and I don't know what it takes to get to what I would call an intermediate level where I really feel like I can play. And so I started first looking at the concrete aspects of that. As a teacher, what am I going to give somebody to practice to help them move forward with that? But when I started working on this book and I came up with the, the memoir idea of tying it into stories, where are the things where I learned these skills that I think have kept me engaged all these years? And it took me back to thinking at the very beginning, well, why did I get into it so much? I know that a year in, people started telling me I sounded like I'd been playing for longer. I can't tell you I had a perception before that that it was coming naturally or that I wasn't struggling. Did something just click at some point? I mean, obviously, when we're all beginning to learn how to play guitar, you're learning scales, hopefully, and, and, and basic chords. But you're right. At some point, that's maybe about as far as you you migrate, as, as, as you get developed. Was it something that just went in your head that you started figuring out that this could go farther? Yeah, but I think it was also just that I loved it more than anything else. I really was... See, when I was in middle school, I was a good, diligent student. And I had this weird experience of being bumped up going from seventh grade to eighth grade into advanced classes. So now I was with the smart kids and I didn't quite feel like I fit in with them. I didn't quite feel as smart as they did. So now I'm struggling a little bit. And this is around the same time I started playing, I guess. And socially, I didn't like school at all. It was, it was for, as it is for many teenagers, it was about what that experience was. But here was this thing that just made me feel good. I'm not going to say that it wasn't always effort. I think it was just that I fell in love with it so much. There was a connection. That there was a connection. So the effort didn't really matter because that was part of the picture. And so when I started looking back at this and saying, well, why was that? I'm not going to say that I didn't have an affinity. I'm not going to say that I wasn't given a gift because I believe that I was. But I've also worked really hard to build all the skills that I have. The thing that I think I really had to start with was I had a good ear in the sense that I could sit down at the piano and play out a melody, but not nearly as, as skilled or sophisticated as some people that I met later on, say when I was going to college, that could just hear something and fully absorb it and comprehend it, like these real exceptional talents. I think I had some talent and I had some ability, but I also was looking for an identity. I was, I was 14 years old. We all are at that age. Yeah. So I was looking for something to connect to. And I had always been kind of bookish, interested in science, and I read a lot and things like that. I don't know if it was connected. I never even thought of this before. This experience of now I'm in with the smart kids and not feeling like I fit in with them either. The guitar just was part of this whole universe that was so exciting. And so I think that that's an important factor that I connected to it because of who I felt like it made me. And also that, like I said, I've always responded very strongly to music. And for me, it's a, a physical experience. So I feel the music, maybe not necessarily in a synesthetic way. You know, when people talk about, you know, hearing colors and seeing tastes and things like that. But I definitely get some kind of physiological response. To this day, even when I get on stage, I move around a lot. I get very into it. I get very intense to the point where people who know me in this kind of setting, if they know me as a teacher and my demeanor in this setting, there's always this, holy, wait, who's that guy? Where did that come from? That has always been in there in some way that my physical response to music is something that's just, it's very satisfying. I've also come to realize that the sense of contact the percussive sense of a guitar or a piano or a drum, something that you hit. There's something very gratifying to me about that response. And I mean, even as a little kid, I was a, and nobody said, you're going to be a drummer, but I was always banging on things and tapping out rhythm. So it, yes, it's definitely in there. And like I said, it was kind of a, an eye opener to realize that not everybody had that. 
But to some degree, someone who just goes like this, a kid that's always tapping on the table might just be jittery. And where do you have a place to put it? And I think in some instances, possibly within the educational system, and this is not knocking that, but they may look at that and go, okay, this kid's, there's something not normal here. Right. Let's try and fix it instead of realizing that there's a creative component being developed there right. on its own. Well, and I think when I was in middle school, so I graduated from high school in 1985. So this is the late 70s, early 80s. I think you're just beginning to have a recognition of these things in education. Fortunately, it was before you started having, and I have to qualify this, because the awareness of, say, kids who are on the spectrum one way or another when they talk about that is really important. But at the same time, there's a part of me that really thinks that if I had been, if I had been 10 years younger and I was in middle school in you know, 1990 instead of 1980, that there might have been some kind of response to that. I don't really know. I'm not trying to self-diagnose or anything like that, but it is really interesting. I have a friend, a piano player that I play with sometimes, who said something like, ah, you know, all these musicians that I know that are, you know, they're like borderline autistic, like so-and-so and so-and-so and and you. And I went, (laughs) wait a minute. You know, I've worked with a lot of artistic autistic kids. I've worked with Asperger's kids. And, you know, there's this definite connection in the response to music. So there is something that may be related there, but you could also make the argument, this is not the you know focus of this podcast, but it's a whole other thing. Maybe some people do get misdiagnosed, or maybe there's just a predisposition that we've started to call X or Y, and that thing can be channeled into something constructive, like playing music, creating art in some way. Right. Or it can go into destructive ways. Like I said, it's not like I was ever diagnosed with anything, but I certainly had as a like preteen at like 11, 12, getting into 13, the hormones are firing and your socially awkward thing is happening. And I definitely had some full blown freakouts in school where I just couldn't deal anymore. So I wonder, you know, that there's an energy there that those freakouts were just like, oh my God, this has nowhere to go. Playing music, I've got a place to put this. I've got a place to channel channel it. it. And it's a, it really is. To say it's a physical sensation isn't always accurate, but it is, though. It, there's a response to what's going on I, there. I agree. I, I think uh, when we use the word channeling, when, when you're playing something, or let's just take it a step further, when you're just listening to music and it affects you, yeah. there's a connection there that, you know, a lot of people will listen to a song and they'll go, that's nice. And you, you listen to a song and you go, Oh my, that brings me to tears right. or, or I'm getting chills or mm-hmm. that's that connection. So it's the same thing if you're playing an instrument as it would be with a painter or an author or, or a dancer. It's yeah. that connection. Absolutely. Well, and so I think that's a big part of the gift, too, is the ability to connect to that. But the other thing that is interesting to me is that people hear different things. That is also one of the gifts is how acute somebody's ear is. And it's just like any other aspect of life. Some people are really good at measuring distance by eye. Some people are just highly coordinated. Some people, I have a lot of friends who are very gifted with mechanical aptitude. They're good engineers, um, a couple of whom are engineers, either structural or recording engineers. You know, I've been on a camping trip with a friend of mine like that. They can just go, grab that, 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 that. Here's the lean-to, boom. Yeah, he's, you know, he's a MacGyver. He, well, yeah, he's looking at a pile of wood and he sees a house. Yeah. No, that's spatial intelligence. I know for a fact that I don't have that because I took that test in third grade that they gave you, or fifth grade or whatever it was, where you had the two-dimensional image, and if this were a 3D image, what would it be? Would it be a cube? Would it be a pyramid or whatever it was? And I was terrible at that. I couldn't envision how this shape would become that. I always felt like I didn't have any mechanical aptitude until I realized finally, I guess I was an adult by this point, that all mechanical things have a logic. You just have to find it. And that was a huge insight. But I think I came to that by realizing that playing the guitar, any instrument, all things you try to accomplish have a logic. There is a, the hands are a mechanism. There's a structure. There's a way that it works. There's basic physics at work. And so we're just trying to get the hands, this mechanism to interact with this instrument. And so you can map out all the details of what that is. That is how some people learn how to play, though. They're they're not necessarily hearing and feeling in the same way, where it is a technical exercise. You know, that gets into the old argument about 
technique versus passion, or if you play technically well, but there's no feeling in it, then nobody cares, which I think is probably true. Getting back to where we started with this, some people hear more in music than others, but very rarely do I come across someone that I can't show them how to hear more. So the ears can be opened, the eyes can be opened, just like the way that I could be taught how to build a house, I can teach somebody how to understand music. And I know these things because I was led down that path. I was ready as a student, I had the open mind, I had the willingness, I had the interest, and I had enough of a gift to already want to be there and want to be engaged in it. But one of the challenges I think people face is that if they don't have the affinity and they don't see those things there, if they are not shown, if they're not taught what to listen for, what to look for, what is going on here, ask the right questions, that opens doors for everybody. So it gets into, I see you've got the, uh, the table of contents open. Chapter two in the book is called The Talent Trap. And it's really about how people who don't feel they have talent will quit before they get anywhere because they are already, and it's the only thing I can think of where somebody would take on an endeavor, a project, an area, feeling from the beginning like they probably can't really do it. It's like saying from the outset, well, I'm not gonna be good at this, but I'm just gonna try it. You know, like if I suddenly said, I love basketball, I'm just gonna go out and I'm gonna practice layups every day. Honestly, could I tell you I think I'd be good at it? No, probably not. I wasn't good at it when I was 12 and my eyesight was a whole lot better. Yeah. But when it comes to music, there's, you don't ever hear people say that if you don't have a gift for athletics that you shouldn't enjoy a pickup game. But with music, you do hear people saying those things. And you hear people starting to play instruments feeling like, I have people walk in for lessons saying, well, I don't need to be good. I might hear that from a songwriter that knows that you only need a handful of chords to be able to write songs. So there's a purely practical, I realize that the skill set I need to develop is not all that large. But to start from the outset and say I don't need to be good, one of the other things I discovered as a student, and I talk about this in the book too, is that even easy things are not necessarily easy. And someone that plays what seems like easy music is probably more skilled than you might think in watching them do it. That there's all these other aspects to what are going on that you don't see if you don't know to look or listen for them. We're going to take a break, get a word in for our sponsors, and then we come back. I want to talk about some of the contents of this book because it is an interesting read. And then I've got a question or two dealing with the future of guitars because that's a topic of conversation that seems to be coming up Mm. uh, quite a bit these days. In the studio with us today, Dave Isaacs, who is the guitar guru of Music Row, also songwriter, musician, teacher, and the author of the book, The Perpetual Beginner, A Musician's Path to Lifelong Learning. Hey, it's Laura Clapp Davidson with Shore, and you're listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hey, it's Chris SD from Sync Songwriter. Imagine what it would be like getting your music into the latest TV shows, movies, or ads. Your songs would not only get exposure in front of millions of viewers, you'd get paid to do it and gain a reputation as the songwriter that you are. I've been showing songwriters, composers, and artists how to get their music into TV and film for over 15 years. Collectively, they have generated hundreds of thousands of dollars from licensing their music. Their music has been on networks such as HBO, Bravo, ABC, NBC, Netflix, and more. In films or trailers such as Predator, Annihilation, Christmas Chronicles, Professor Mac, and many others. So many songwriters upload their music to websites hoping to get discovered. Unfortunately, this almost never happens with the millions of songs out there competing for attention. I show you how to get your music heard by the people who can actually make it happen for you. When you start getting your music licensed, you automatically develop a reputation in the industry. This lets you get syncs over and over again. If you'd like to discover how to connect with the right people in music licensing, just click the Sync Songwriter logo on the Business Side of Music webpage, and I'll see you there. Wow, I just joined the Music Starts Here community. This is a truly hidden gem for anyone in the music business. Whether you live in Nashville or anywhere else in the world, Music Starts Here is like a GPS for your music career. This is the place to be if you want to get advice and direction from some seriously talented musical people who have been where you want to go. 
music news, events, and a great big community with resources for artists, songwriters, musicians, studio and tech, along with music business advice from pros in the industry, all on one site? Make sure you get your free profile now. Go to www.musicstartshere.org. That's musicstartshere.org. You're listening to the business side of music. Sitting across the table from me here in Nashville, Tennessee, Dave Isaacs, the guitar guru of Music Row, songwriter, musician, teacher, and author of the book, The Perpetual Beginner, A Musician's Path to Lifelong Learning. Songwriting, was that something that came to you rather easily? Or? Not at all. It's something that I wanted to do once, I, I guess, I'd been playing for a couple of years before I started thinking about just making things up. Um, I was also learning how to improvise, so I think that might have been what started that. In terms of actually writing songs, sitting down and writing the lyrics, even when I was first starting to play the guitar, I was writing lyrics. And before I started playing music, I think I had believed that that was more the path I was going to go down, that I was going to be a writer or a scientist or something like that. I was writing lyrics, none of which have survived to this day unless they're in a box in my mother's house somewhere. And I don't know that I would want anybody to see them, but every songwriter I know has that folder from right. when they were first starting. And then I think the, the funny thing is that I wasn't trying to write the music. Now, maybe I thought I was just going to do that at some point, but I didn't actually finish a song until, oh, I was in college. So I was in my early 20s before I sat down and really said, okay, I'm writing a song now. So that was not the initial thing. And even to this day, I struggle with it. I love it. But I write songs specifically so I can have something to sing. And I think one of the things that happens over time, and it happens to everybody, is as you become better at one thing than another, it's just easier to take that path of least resistance. It's easy for me to make up things on the guitar. It's a whole lot harder to sit down and write a good song. I work with people every day that they get up in the morning, they write a song, they write another song. That is what they're committed to. And I get that, and that's great. That's not me. But at the same time, it sort of enters, it opens up this door of when a person walks in my studio and says, well, I'm not a musician, I'm a songwriter. And my response is, well, do you write poetry or do you write songs? And they'll say, I write songs. Well, you are making music. Whether you call yourself a musician gets into this weird thing of, is there a certain thing you need to be able to do to call yourself that? And is that what those people that were saying, I'm still a beginner, when do I get past that? Is that what they're looking for? And the flip side of that is, if I play the guitar every day, but I don't write songs every day, am I a songwriter? Well, sure I am. Yeah. These labels become so counterproductive. It's almost like, yeah, the, you get hung up on that, the semantics of it all, instead of really what it is, that discipline that you're trying to learn, right. whether it's being a, a guitarist or it's being a songwriter or whatever it is. Just do it. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, getting back to the idea of identity and how it's connected. I mean, I, I know looking back as an adult now, how much of my sense of self is, has been wrapped up in playing music and playing the guitar. And it started as a teenager because it made me cooler. And then it continued on because as I started to get good, it made me more competent and confident because here was a thing I could excel at. And Then we go down that path of least resistance. I'm going to take this on because this is where I feel strong is in this area. But, you know, I think you get to a point in your life where you start feeling like I don't have to define myself as X or Y. And it's funny how Nashville kind of prefers, I think, Nashville likes you to pick a lane and stay in it. And part of that is a necessity of with so many talented people in one place, It really helps get things done if you know this is the person for X and this is the person for Y. But when I first got here and people said, well, what did you come here to do? Are you a player? Are you a writer? Do you want to be a sideman? Do you want to be an artist? And my answer was, well, I just came here to live. I do all of those things. Where I found place for myself, though, in the community was as a teacher. And it's still probably how the most people know me. And that's okay, and that's ultimately where most of my energy ended up going. And it's a combination of, on the one side, the path of least resistance, and on the other side, probably the more positive way to look at that is it's where the momentum was. It's where the doors opened up consistently one after another. But then also that gets more energy because you start putting more behind the, you know, you bet on the horse that's in front. I always liked teaching, but before I moved to Nashville, I was teaching 
kids in the neighborhood and I worked at a couple of music stores giving lessons and I had a band and I was a gigging musician. And then coming here, I tried doing all of it for a while, primarily a freelance guitar player for a couple of years, teaching on the side, and then through a whole variety of circumstances, um, I had an artist project that I had been committing myself to that fell apart. My wife got laid off from a corporate job about a week later. This is 2008 when the bottom started dropping out of the economy. And yet a week after that, I get an offer to teach college, teach a music theory class, and I'll get benefits teaching one class. So yeah, sure, I'll do that. So now you want to take another class. Okay. Now there's an adjunct position over here. Do you want to take that on? Now I'm at two schools part-time. Now one of them offers me full-time. So now I'm a full-time college professor, and I did that for five years. And obviously that takes away a lot of time from being able to write music and perform and all of those things. For a while, I thought, well, maybe this is the next path, but ultimately decided that the institutional environment is not where I do best. And so I went back out on my own. So I'd walked away from a salary and benefits. Now I've got to make a living. And I've been teaching. I got a reputation already doing this. So let's put all the energy here. So over the last, you know, 10 years, really, that's where most of my focus has been. I want to jump around a little bit on the book. One of the chapters I found interesting, The Purest and the Maverick. I somehow knew you were going there. <laughs> <laughs> I have a knack for those things, okay. I guess. Let's talk about that just a little bit. First of all, there are people that like to think outside the box. Yes. I'm one of those individuals that says there is no box. Throw the box away. Mm -hmm. I guess in a way that would make me the maverick. But yeah. at the same time, it's, you know, if I'm doing woodworking, it's a hobby of mine. I love to do it. I will take so much time to seek perfection on whatever it is sure. that I'm doing. Can you be both? I don't think seeking perfection makes you a purist. Okay. I think what makes you a purist is holding up something else as an example of perfection and saying, if I don't achieve this, then I haven't accomplished what I want to accomplish. Gotcha. And there's nothing wrong with making that choice. Where I have a problem with it is when it becomes restrictive in the sense that you play a song a certain way and somebody says, well, you know, that's not the right way to play it. And there's plenty of those people out there. Yes, there that are. That will tell you that. Yeah. And there is a time and place for that way of thinking. If the thing that you're doing is a genre piece or a stylistic, you know, you're shooting a scene from a movie, there's a band playing, it's 1940, it has to look and sound like it would. This is part of the reason people still study orchestration. You know, if you're, say, a film composer or even a TV, you're writing music for TV, there's a string quartet and a scene. Well, you should have an idea of what that's supposed to sound like. It's got to be appropriate. And there are times someone just says, I fell in love with the way Robert Johnson played the blues and I want to sound like that. Great. But if then that becomes your definition of what blues, in air quotes, is, if you want to chase that, great. If I don't, you have no right to say you're not doing it right. And the thing that really reinforces that to me is that the people who had the greatest impact in music, the people who are the greatest inspirations to the greatest number of people, every one of them threw away the box and found their own way to do it. And I think of a friend of mine, and I'll give a shout out to my buddy Chris Watkins. As an artist, he goes by Preacher Boy, but he's also a very, very good writer, music blogger. He wrote a piece about the blues, and his music is bluesy, but not at all in the box in any way. He was talking about people saying, well, you know, Muddy didn't do it like that. And his language, I'm not going to be as appropriately, perfectly sarcastic as he was, but it was basically like saying, are you too stupid to realize that Muddy Waters was an innovator and that he went to Chicago and created something that had never been before and did not sound like where he started and everybody imitated him? And now you're saying, well, you have to do it exactly like him? And if the answer to that is, well, you're not Muddy Waters, well, fine, hang it up. You know, what's, it's a pointless discussion and people get into this thing, you have to do it this way. When every one of my inspirations took their inspirations and filtered it through their own musical sensibility and tried to achieve perfection in their own way, but they set the standard by their interpretation of what they're taking in. Now, someone like me, I came into it as a student and when you sign up to study, you are showing up to be taught, to be led. And for me, that was a long 10-year process of playing on my own, taking guitar lessons, now music school, now graduate school. So it's a lot of guidance. That's a lot of being told the right or wrong way to do it. And this was in classical guitar where there's definitely an, an orthodoxy and a, 
and an approach. And coming to it now, you know, it's everyone has to go through that to some degree because that's how you develop skills. You need the guidance. That's one of the things the book is about is this is the guidance I got. These are the lessons that I learned. But you do at some point have to say, okay, how do I do this? And even if that means making a change, oh my God, you know, the composer didn't say to do that or the person who did that song the first time didn't say to do that. Well, but this is how I do it. Well, it's wrong. Well, is it? It gets into this whole philosophical thing of are you trying to measure up to something or are you trying to create? When you're creating something, whether you're emulating by design or just by happenstance, you're still creating something. At a certain moment, it's an original embodiment of work. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be trapped by, well, I have to compare this to somebody else. Make it your own create it and get it and and you know what with any luck it's going to grow sure. it's it's going to just get better and better and better as you develop it so yeah. well and i think it also speaks to what i've come to believe is a whether you want to say it's a problem or an issue i don't know what the right word is but the way music music education works i look at the system that i went through and the way that i was taught what i was taught is to be a skilled professional musician in the sense that I can learn to accomplish whatever I need for this gig or that gig. In other words, you're diverse enough and flexible enough that you can make your choices based on the, the demands of the situation you're in, whether that's playing one style or another, or whether it's being authentic to a particular subgenre or something like that. Now, that's great. That is what you need to be a working pro, but none of my inspirations were those people. I mean, they might have you know, played, suppose Paul Simon was playing, you know, club dates in the 60s. He was actually a really fine guitar player. But all the artists that inspire me, all the people who I think inspired everybody, they might have been taught something, but they still found their own way through it at some point. So if your goal is to be a working musician, particularly in a place like Nashville, where there is such a, there's a pipeline, there's a way things are done, there's a system and there's a norm. And you really are, if you want to work expected to be able to reproduce a particular sound. That's fine. That's, those are the demands of the gig. But that's specific to that situation. So when you go to study, you're being prepared to be a functional professional musician. Professional, whether you're getting paid or not, you know, to have the, that professional skill set. You're not necessarily being trained to be an artist. Does that matter? Is that highbrow language? I don't know. But too many people are not encouraged to be creative, or you hear stories about, well, I took lessons, but I, my teacher wanted to keep me in the book, and I just couldn't do it. Well, how do you cultivate that? It's like the kid tapping on the desk. How do you cultivate whatever is in there? And it just it struck me as a big realization, because I'd never thought of it that way before. You can have all the schooling you want, but yet the people that hit you hardest generally are not the ones that were taught in a rigorous manner. Now, on the other side of it, Picasso was a great figurative painter, that he had to have the skills that he had to be able to paint a nose on top of somebody's head. It wasn't like he just put it in the wrong place because that's where it went. So there is a continuum there of how much skill it's necessary to have. And I come back to coming to believe at this point that I think I have developed right brain and left brain skills because I think really speaking to another misconception, well, you know, you're a musician. I know you under, you don't, I actually had somebody say to me, well, I know you're an artist, so you don't understand deadlines. And I just looked at him yeah. like, I've, I've uh -huh. heard that a lot too. Yeah. Or, well, you know, you musicians are just wired differently. So, to some degree, yes, but it's kind of like with business and I guess what we might call the left brain stuff. I might not have an affinity for mathematical calculation, but I can sit down and do it. And no one's expectation when I was in high school was that I shouldn't be able to do math. The expectation was, no, we need you to get it to this point. We don't care if you're good at it or not. Or rather, we don't care how hard you have to work to get there. You're expected to have this. But with music, it's a different thing. And so you have this continuum of, I think, to, to build a career for yourself, you need left brain and right brain. You need creativity and you need structure. And to say you have to pick one or the other is foolish, but you're going to have a predisposition to one side or the other. And if you want to be complete and what I believe is the benchmark for that 
competence that brings the confidence, that thing all these people are looking for when they say, I still feel like a beginner, you do have to be creative enough to explore and concrete enough to do the, the work of developing the mechanics. And you can't have one without the other and be fully balanced. We're going to take another break, get another word in for our sponsors, and then come back. I want to talk to you about, is anybody teachable? Can anybody learn the guitar? And then I want to talk about the future of the guitarist out there. In the studio with us today, Dave Isaacs, a guitar guru of Music Row, songwriter, musician, teacher, and author of the book, The Perpetual Beginner, A Musician's Path to Lifelong Learning. Hello, this is Michael Elsner, and you are listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Hi, this is Vinnie Rebus, the founder of Vinnie Connect. Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag.com. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey. You're listening to the business side of music. We're back in the studio. Dave Isaacs, the author of The Perpetual Beginner, A Musician's Path to lifelong learning. Can anybody who wants to, can they learn the guitar? I mean, is are there just some people out there that just, you know, you kind of can't even put a left foot, right front, or maybe left hand, right hand, can't figure out the instrument? But is we know we've talked about some people just hit the wall. But can anybody learn the basics of playing a guitar and hopefully get some enjoyment out of it? I think so. I mean... The only time I have ever come across someone that I didn't think was teachable was if their attitude was wrong. And the wrong attitude is, I can't do it, so I'm not going to work hard enough to actually make it happen because I don't believe I really can. Or, I mean, when I was teaching kids, and sometimes they were just casual about it and weren't all that interested. I don't have that problem now because everybody who walks in the door of my studio wants to learn. I think some people have a steeper learning curve. Some people have more of an uphill climb to get there. But... When you break it down to, we can describe whether you're talking about the technique and the mechanics or we're talking about understanding the music, we can categorize, organize, and describe what all of those things are and work you through it. So it's almost maybe two things, maybe more, but it's attitude and it's mechanics. Yeah. If you have the right attitude, you can learn the mechanics. Yes. If you don't have that attitude, the mechanics are just going to yeah. be... Because the mechanics are just physical. It's the laws of physics of motion and movement in the universe. So all of that works. Now, you can't disregard the fact that some people, and I've seen this, I, like I said, I've been teaching for 30 years. There are people I show a couple of things to, and they can play a bunch of chords in one lesson. There are people that after three months still can't get a chord to ring. Yeah. But there's other factors in there, too. How much time is that person... Now, the one who can just do it immediately, okay, great. Clearly, 
excuse me, there's an affinity there. But at the same time, maybe their guitar is set up to be more playable than the other person who's struggling. And we try to take those things into account. But I just feel like the affinity part of it is the least important part of the equation. And if somebody wants it enough, they're going to stay on it. And I've seen it again and again with people who didn't believe they had any real ability, but they cared about music and just wanted it enough that they made it happen. And I know some very successful musicians that have said that. Robert Fripp, that founded the band King Crimson, said he had a tin ear, that he just surrounded himself by great people who could show him the right things and became a very successful artist. Yeah. So I do think anybody can learn. I think it's difficult for some people to stay in it long enough to get past the frustration, which is also part of the big, one of the big topics of the book. And I think that's something else, too, is uh, there's a little bit of frustration in everything that you do in life anyway. So you almost have to have that mindset that, okay, you're going to have these obstacles or you're going to have these hurdles, or in some cases you're going to have a wall. And you're just going to have to power through those and, and get beyond that. But once you do, I would think the satisfaction of making that next step, that next level, a, a, as you said, maybe it's from a very beginner status to an intermediate. It's kind of like when you snow ski. There's a reason you start on the bunny slopes and you don't get on the black diamond. Right. You know, it's it's for for your safety, but it's also you're not going to enjoy yourself if you're up there and you're just falling down a lot. So it's it's baby steps to start. But once you get that and you get the momentum going, then I think a lot of it is is mindset too, right? It, it is. And it's also what you have the opportunity to do in the sense that playing simple things is maybe not all that gratifying on your own, but playing something simple as part of a group, if your simple contribution is helping make this big, beautiful sound, well, that's something else entirely. And so one of the things I tell people a lot is you want to find something you can do that's satisfying that's not hard to do. Make sure that as you're, this is one of the other challenges with studying, is that a teacher always wants to keep you growing. And so you're constantly being given things that stretch your abilities. But if you live on the edge of your abilities all the time, there's not a whole lot of satisfaction from that. It's the, the triumphs are spread out. They're few and far between. So you have to be able to take a step back and just do something that feels good. Yeah. If you're really into and moved by complicated music, doing something simple might not do that. But at the same time, there's something so fundamental to settle into a groove. But, you know, but it took me a lot of years to begin to understand that because the guitar for me was this aggressive thing for a long time. And when I started really understanding more about music and rhythm and feeling it and you know like when I was 14 well god why would you want to play bass you know guitar is so much more exciting and so no 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 play one note on a bass and play it right especially when you got one of those big eight speaker cabinets going on just and the whole world is vibrating is like, yeah you know that's a feeling that's a thing that's simple you can boom 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 well, I could hang out here for a while. This feels good. And we have all this technology available to us now. You know, we can find backing tracks on the Internet. We can create our own backing tracks on a computer or on your phone. There's all these things that you can do. We have all these tools that make it easier for people to learn if you know what tools to use and how to find them. So, I mean, my biggest point is that there's always something else you can do as long as you keep your eyes open for another option. I want to sidebar here for a minute uh, out, outside of the book and everything else. Musically, from from a guitarist standpoint, is there a certain guitarist that inspires you or influences you more than others? Is there somebody that you just love to listen to? Or is it just kind of like the whole plethora of guitarists out there? Is, is there who Who is it that you listen to? Well, at this point, it's so vast that I... I mean, I could tell you who I started with. In terms of who inspires me now, there are so many. And I'm my interests are pretty wide. So I can be interested in you know, completely different styles of music and completely different playing approaches. I've rediscovered the classical guitar again recently, which is something I, I mean, I studied seriously. I finished two degrees and then pretty much walked away from it completely for 20 years and just started picking it up and practicing it again. And so there's, there's aspects of that I love, but I 
turned a teenage student yesterday on to John Lee Hooker. It's one chord. You know, there's something beautiful and amazing about both of those things on both extremes. I mean, when I started playing, the my first guitar teacher gave me a cassette with Eric Clapton on one side, Jimi Hendrix on the other, and said, start here. And that was a good place for me to start. And that remains that style, you know, that late 60s, early 70s, blues, rock influenced sound is uh, at this point so deep in where I am. So, you know, when I was in high school, it was Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, um, you know, from Led Zeppelin. But so now I discover Pink Floyd. Now I discover the Grateful Dead. I discover the Allman Brothers and all of these, all of these bands. And it just keeps growing, you know. And then I start reading guitar magazines. Well, who's this? Who's that? Well, what do they sound like? And so there's so much that's out there. And now it's just you know, with the music industry becoming as vast and fragmented as it is, where there are subgenres of subgenres and people that have found audiences doing very specific things. I mean, people have pushed the, the technical part of guitar playing to amazing degrees. The norm within a... It's a, it's a sub-genre, it's a subset of all people that play guitar, but the norm within, say, for example, the people that are pushing the, um, the boundaries of what's technically possible is so far ahead of what was considered, of what would have been that, you know, 40 years ago. But at the same time, go back and watch, you know, Merle Travis, Roy Clark, some of these guys. There was a video of Roy Clark, I mean, he's got to be 20-something years old, and from the 50s, he's doing something on TV, but playing like Sugarfoot Rag or something like that. And I don't care how good anybody is or how far you've pushed the envelope, still try to do that, yeah. you know? Jerry Reed was that way. Jerry Reed was that way. And Jer and he was somebody that I came to later on. And, you know, so many people go, oh, I never knew he was, I just thought he did funny songs. You know, it's like Brad Paisley is like that. That guy is so good, it's scary. Yeah, yeah they're amazing pickers. Uh, I mean, absolutely incredible. And there would be no Brad Paisley without Jerry Reed. And there would be no Jerry Reed without Merle Travis and Chet Atkins and, you know, all of all of that. So there's always somebody else to discover. I got turned on recently to a jazz guitarist named Julian Lage, who is just amazing, but not necessarily in the technical way. It's his choices. I mean, he's a great technical player, but he plays these things that I go, where did that even come from? And then on the other hand, I got turned on to a young guitarist named Sarah Longfield. She's maybe 27, 28, and she plays two hands tapping on an eight string guitar so she's hitting bass notes on one side and trebles on the other uh, and stanley jordan started doing this back in the 80s but this is now a norm within a particular subgenre of what they call progressive music and i mean she can do things i can't even i mean i know how she's doing it but it's the same thing i watched sonny landreth play slide and i i know what his hands are doing because i can watch him and i can see it but i'm not getting that sound when i try to do that you know, and, it, and it's no different than when I was 13 and heard Eddie Van Halen the first time. I was like, that's a guitar? How does that even happen? So there's always somebody else that's going to come along and spin your head around. Future of guitarists. I'm seeing more and more articles where guitar sales are down and, and you know, because of the way music is programmed these days. Mm -hmm. Is there a future for the guitarist? I mean, oh, yeah. you, you talk about the development. I mean, let's jump from King Crimson mm -hmm. to Dream Theater. Right. I mean, it's just the development of that music sure, exactly. is so over the top now. There's still room for guitar, so I would assume. Well, absolutely there is. I mean, my, my theory is that the, the innovation in music over the last 30 years has been more sonic than musical in the sense that the vocabulary of sounds that we can use in making music has grown into a ridiculous exponential degree because of the growth of technology. So when I would, for example, assign my theory class a final project, and this is when I was teaching at the Art Institute, so this is an audio production program. So these are students who are learning how to record music, create music on a workstation, things like that. And so teaching this music theory class, they were supposed to be learning about chord structure, song structure. So they had a final project to record a piece of music between one and two minutes long that has two distinct sections, clear chord changes, and a clear melody. Okay, simple enough. 
so many of these students who were listening to electronica and hip hop couldn't wrap their brains around the idea of chord changes because all the music that they were listening to and emulating didn't have changing chords, it had changing sounds. And so the, the sonics have become so important. And you see this in pop music now. I mean, it's been going on for a lot of years, but now it's very, very common for a pop song to have the same four chord cycle again and again and again through the whole thing. But what changes is the sounds and the textures. So taking this back to the guitar, the guitar is now one of those sounds and textures. And I feel like what's happening in popular music is that people are starting to meld the older, more traditional sounds with the newer electronic sounds. And the older sounds are used almost as a, as a touchstone, as a, sty a stylistic signal. Like, for example, um, Ed Sheeran has a new record out of all uh, do, uh, collaborations. And one of those has Bruno Mars and somebody else on it. But the song sounds like it could be Led Zeppelin or Aerosmith. It's a 70s hard rock approach. So they looked at that as a model and said, we're going to use this sound to do that. Or somebody uses a, a national resonator guitar, you know, a steel body, and playing it with a slide, and it's that Delta Blues sound. And that's a stylistic touchstone that's pushing your ear in this direction. And now we're mixing this and that. And I think a guitar is still fundamentally, um, I think all instruments really, there's something fundamental about being able to just make sound on a string that's very satisfying and people are still interested in it. And let's face it, the violin, the viola, the cello, and the string bass, mm -hmm. they've been around for hundreds upon hundreds of years right. and they're still viable. They're still viable. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I also think that there's all kinds of innovations. People are, people are trying to find ways to make guitars into controllers so that you can use guitars to trigger all the digital sounds and things like that. And I think that's a cool idea, but I would still personally, I would rather use one of those push controllers and push buttons or a keyboard or something like that. I like the tactile aspect of it. If you've seen the, you know, some of the innovations like the Seaboard, have you seen this thing? Mm -mm. It's a keyboard that doesn't have keys. It's a, a textured surface that has raised bumps where the black keys would be. And so you can slide your fingers off from the white key, what would be white keys to black keys, but you're just looking at one monochromatic surface. And so you can play it like a keyboard if you're landing in the right places, but then you can slide from note to note. You can change the sound by changing your touch because it's touch sensitive. And it's just amazing. Like it's adding this third dimension or fourth dimension to the tactile sense of it. And developing something like that on a guitar-like instrument would be interesting. And there is, there's a couple of digital instruments out there like that, that do things like that, that use a guitar model I mean, there's one, I think it's called the Artifon, where you can, it has what looks like frets and strings, and you can fret where the fret hand would be and strum where that would be, or you can hold it flat and play it like a keyboard. I mean, there's all kinds of different things you can do with it. But at the same time, people do still appreciate, look at how popular acoustic music still is, and how popular acoustic guitars are, and that even within pop songs, sometimes from artists that are doing very, very digitally created music, then they'll come out and they'll do a song that's just acoustic guitar. Or every young artist that I know has acoustic covers on YouTube, where they get up and they play an acoustic guitar and sing the song. That hasn't changed. How can people find you? First of all, how can they get the book, The Perpetual Beginner? The book is available everywhere. Books can be bought. So it is on the great behemoth that everyone's going to go to first. Um, I'm also a big supporter of independent bookstores. So if you have a favorite indie bookstore, you can ask them to order it. But it is online, at found at all the usual suspects. And the good news is it's a hard copy. It's a hard copy. Yeah. There, there is an e-book as well. So that that is available. But... Yes, it's a physical book. I was able to actually crowdfund this project. I raised several thousand dollars to pay for the design and production, and I was able to make what really feels like a real book. It doesn't feel homemade. It doesn't feel like a zine. I don't expect to be you know, smelling ditto sheets or anything like that when I put the thing down. It really, um, I'm, I'm very proud of the physical object. It feels like a piece of art. 
and also uh, available for me directly through NashvilleGuitarGuru.com. And that's how they can find you. That's where you can find me. Dave, thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Don't forget to check out our affiliates, including Lab Canna, fine hemp products since 2014. Click on their link on our website for more information and how to order their product line. If you're interested in getting your music into film or television, click on the Sync Songwriter link on our website. Absolutely the best way to get your songs listened to by top TV and film music supervisors. This is how you can get your songs quickly licensed for your favorite TV shows and movies. Click on our website link to get a free digital copy of Larry Butler's new rule book for singers and songwriters. 101 ways to help improve your chances of success. Also, check out our other affiliate, Music Starts Here. You can find them at musicstartshere.org. Probably the best one-stop shop for the singer, songwriter, or aspiring musician who's relocating to Nashville or wants to. Last but not least, shameless plug for this podcast. Become a YouTube subscriber by going to the Business Side of Music page. You can hear all of our released episodes there. Also, check out our website at businesssideofmusic.com. Follow us on Facebook at the Business Side of Music podcast and on Twitter at Biz Side of Music. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan. 